Welcome. Uh, I think we'll just get started because um, this is a relatively short talk. Short talk. Um, I'm de delighted to introduce Michael Ed and Elise Bohan today, um, where they're going to be leading a discussion um, about their respective areas of expertise. Uh, Michael Ed is a senior research scholar at the EA think tank Rethink Priorities, where he mainly focuses on AI safety and long-termism risk. And Elise Bohan is a senior research scholar at the Future of Humanity Institute. She holds a PhD in evolutionary macro history uh, and wrote the world's first book-length history on transhumanism. Uh, so there's going to be, they're going to talk a bit about their respective areas of expertise and hold a bit of a discussion between themselves. And then there'll be a Q&A section, um, which uh, Michael will be leading. Uh, so you can submit Q&A questions through Swapcard if you go to the event on the event, like through Swapcard, it will have live discussion. If you press on that, you'll be able to ask questions through there. So I welcome Michael and uh, Elise. Cool. Uh, Elise, do you want to jump into like generally situating this uh, talk and then we can chat amongst ourselves a bit? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks everyone for coming. I will keep the talking part relatively short and try and keep time for questions as long as possible. Uh, and I'll just jump in with a, a bit of background about how I got into telling stories, both written and oral, in, in EA and in transhumanism, and how I came to be working at the Future of Humanity Institute. It wasn't a case of being, you know, a six-year-old looking up at the stars and kind of going, ah, yes, to infinity and beyond. That's, that's my dream one day. I want to end up in this kind of a place. It really started much smaller with this idea of loving stories and being fascinated by what it means to be human. And I found that that was my philosophical inroad to the big questions of life, that I read as much canonical literature as I could get my hands on, as much poetry, eventually branching out into philosophy, and as you study humans through storytelling, you eventually start to realise, oh, okay, I'm seeing a lot of the same patterns recur. And bigger philosophical questions are opening up and suddenly the tools of the humanities after a while didn't seem like quite enough to unpick this thing that is what it means to be human. And so you start going down, you know, not in my formal studies, but just out of curiosity, you go down rabbit holes, as generalist thinkers like to do, and you start reading evolutionary psychology and evolutionary biology, um, and you come to think, well, okay, if I want to know more about the human condition and what this is all about, the big question is, where is it all going? And that's really what got me into, into evolutionary macro history. I wanted this bigger sense of where we come from, what it's all about to be human, and then what the opportunities for our species really look like. And I think in many ways, you know, I'm, I'm a very atypical person to have ended up somewhere like FHI. Um, so it might be an interesting, an interesting example for some of you who are sort of thinking, you know, I'm, I'm not a quant, I'm not sure if my skills are really valued here. I don't know if these kinds of organisations want people like me uh, working for them. And I think there really is so much value in being able to, to speak cogently, to write clear prose, to explain complex concepts simply. And I don't think I'm anywhere near the, the pinnacle of that endeavour. I'm still someone who's very early in the game, still trying to figure out what that looks like and how all that works. Um, but the power of storytelling is quite incredible. Uh, there's, you know, there's the two sides of that, that of course, for any, any great cause that we really care about to, to shift to the levers of the world in a, in a good direction, we do need powerful stories. But at the same time, I am also really mindful that those stories can be used in a kind of propagandistic way, um, that there is an element to which you're trying to actually hack human minds to, to win hearts and minds for a cause. And so there is a really interesting tension going on there as well. Um, I think I will, I will throw it over to Michael to see if he wants to jump in at, at any point here and just reflect on some of that. Cool, yeah, um, just like to help setting the stage, 
your storytelling is mostly focused on transhumanism, but also to some extent the long-term future and long -term, and like why to care about the long-term future. Is, is that correct? Yeah, both things. I mean, my PhD research focuses on transhumanism, the history of those ideas, how they're influential, why they matter. But I think at this point I'm focusing sort of less on that movement and, yeah, much more on the, the long-term future of humanity uh, and stories that could help us think, help, you know, cogently about that. Cool. And, and could you give a really quick uh, overview of what transhumanism is? Yeah, sure. So it is a philosophy and social movement that is all about using science and technology to expand the human reach over the natural world to help us become not just the best darn humans that we can be, but something that's actually uh, so radically enhanced that it's more than human, that it's post-human. Cool. Okay, so a first question that I'll throw to you and then I'll maybe share some thoughts on is um, when we do succeed at using stories to make the long-term future seem important and transhuman and transhumanism get taken seriously and things like that, uh, what, do, what do you expect to be like the main positive and negative effects of that? Uh, and what would you see as the key case for, for putting a lot of effort into using these stories and getting these ideas taken seriously? Um, so for long-termism and, and transhumanism, I think um, slightly different answers. The positive for transhumanism I really see is a bit of an anodyne for future shock. I don't think we have good narratives that help humans prepare existentially and psychologically for this idea that we're kind of living at a rug pull moment in history where a lot of our 20th century life scripts are being challenged, upended to some degree, um, and potentially in the future that we could see uh, a lot more change and a lot more disruption in our world than we expect. And I think internalising some aspects of a transhumanist worldview, which doesn't mean you have to be, you know, a card-carrying transhumanist and think the singularity is a great thing, only that you're sort of thinking in terms of what transhuman technologies could do to our species can help you think ahead when it comes to the automation of certain professions, uh, changes to dating and mating rituals, human communication, um, the way our institutions get run. I think it's really important that way. Whereas long-termism, I see that the big payoff being uh, regarding taking existential risks much more seriously. And I think the payoffs are pretty obvious there. The negatives for like a lot of people thinking about this stuff might actually be a kind of uh, almost the opposite of what I was talking about with future shock, that we don't quite know how to cope with philosophies of the future uh, that decenter the human to the degrees that these two do. And I think there may actually be a level of interim despair in some people that is actually really hard to live through in a transitional moment. Yeah, I think I, I, I would echo some similar points from my own perspective on that. I, I think um, some reasons I would see, tr I, I think existential risk is a key priority of our time. And so a lot of it filters through how does it change how people relate to existential risk. And transhumanism, one reason it could be helpful is it shakes people out of imagining the future is kind of like the present, but the cars float or something. Um, and instead seeing like just how wacky things could be in like positive or negative ways. And, and then they could take more seriously both why this is really like valuable, what we could get to, and also why by default it might not happen. Um, and, and partly it's like a big part of why existential risk matters. Part of it is just everyone could die that we know. That's obviously bad. But also um, just the future could be so long and so big and so good. And I guess transhumanism connects a lot to how good it could be, which uh, magnifies how bad it will be if we lose it. Um, yeah, I think some bad things could be just like, if we get a lot of people to be just public, rabid fans of these ideas, but with a silly version, then it could increase the extent to which it seems like some sort of weird sci-fi thing rather than like a serious academic thing that policymakers take seriously. So I think we've got to like carefully message. Um, yeah, another question for you, and then maybe I'll throw it to the audience, is... Um, what, what are some challenges you faced when trying to tell stories about the future and get people to take these ideas seriously? Yeah, so piggybacking off the idea that these are can be very confronting and destabilising ideas, there's another challenge that I found particularly when writing about uh, long-term futures and anything that kind of is in an AI-saturated or an AGI world. I'd kind of like cluster this challenge under the idea of event horizon topics. I don't think there is anything in the, the writing world or the public communication world that is harder to do than to get people to internalise why they should care about the kind of future that we almost by definition can't paint a picture of. 
We can kind of give the general sense of it could be very good or it could be very bad. But people really want that fleshy, tactile, tangible sense of what's my life going to be like in 20 years? And what's a trip to the doctor going to be like? And what are urban environments going to be like? And once you hit a certain level, you can sort of lead people up there with, um, you know, the next 10 years of, of prognostication. But you do really hit a point where you're kind of saying there's going to be a rupture in the fabric of reality. And so one of the ways that I handled that in my book uh, was right at the end in the postscript where I'd sort of made my arguments for this being a make or break century and maybe there's aspects to that that aren't as bad as we think, to try and get an audience to internalise, well, post-humanity might not necessarily be bad, even though it's not what we recognise as human that's familiar and comforting, uh, was to do a thought experiment where I actually got the audience or the reader to put themselves in the shoes of a non-human, so in this case, a cat. And we were describing, you know, imagine what your life would be like if... The, your programming just encoded you to play with colourful balls of yarn and kill other animals for pleasure and sustenance. And this is, this is the definition of cat manatee. And to you, this is all pretty good, right? So if you tried to describe to a cat what it's like to be a human, you talk about understanding the mysteries of the universe, quantum mechanics, Picasso paintings, all these kinds of things... If, you know, assuming the cat can understand our thought experiment, the cat's going to be totally perplexed by all of this. Like, what is, what is the value of this humanity you speak of? Because by definition, it doesn't have the intelligence uh, and the cognitive wiring to understand all the things that give richness and beauty to our existence, whether it is listening to Mozart or falling in love or complex moral dilemmas that challenge us uh, intellectually. And so the analogy is really, well... We are to post-humans what cats are to humans. And I think some of those techniques when you're trying to convey things and, you know, telling that in a vivid way for an audience can at least help get around the event horizon challenge. Because I think what authors often do default to instead of that is writing books with titles about the future that sound really exciting, whether it's, you know, about sex robots or homo deus or whatever it might be. And then, like, the first third of the book is, like, talking about Aristotle and H.G. Wells and what Arthur C. Clarke said once upon a time, and you're kind of like, no, 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 take a punt, tell me, what, tell me what's coming. Like, the future is the most exciting part of the story often, but the hardest to convey. So that's a really an ongoing challenge, and I'd love to see writing and storytelling in the EA community that uh, takes up the challenge of making that vivid for people. Yeah, I think that, I think that makes sense to me. Some thoughts from me on this... Um, I think that an issue some people have flagged is that if you don't paint a concrete picture, then it might not seem exciting. But any concrete utopia you try to sketch out, people will think, oh, I don't know, that seems too, too dimensional, too boring. Um, and so what might be good is to give them a sort of like broad menu of utopias and to emphasize the point of we don't get there by accident. We aren't suddenly jumping into one of these randomly. What we want to achieve, well, we might, and that would be bad. What we want to achieve is empowering humans and post-humans to at any point like make informed decisions about where to where to send themselves and where we end up we chose we want to get so like we can trust that those people made a good decision and trying to maybe emphasize that could help but i'm not sure how well that actually works with people that's just like something i imagine would work for me at least um okay so jumping to some questions from the audience uh and feel free to anyone else add things to the swap card uh, one question is, uh, they start with a compliment, so I'll read that out. Um, you're clearly both experienced communicators of long-term risk and prospects. Thank you. Um, what continue to be the pushbacks that you hear? And what concepts that you, what, what are the concepts you most struggle to communicate and persuade people to understand? I think I was talking to someone about this earlier. It is not the idea that things will change in our lifetime. I think that's pretty well internalised. And we've all heard the well-worn quip about the supercomputer in our pockets and the more computing power than the... Uh, computers that sent humans to space and, and all the rest of it. And it's, it's almost become banal. We can talk about individual things like certain jobs disappearing due to industrial robots. But when you start trying to talk about the bigger leap uh, from human to post-human, that at some point we're no longer the same species, at some point a lot of our values and ways of life have changed, again, coming to that event horizon... I think that's the leap in which people intuitively often that's the point where they, they shut down. Uh, and I'm still trying to navigate uh, ways to, 
to make that less threatening, um, while also being sensitive to the fact that it is an idea that is really, really threatening, and we shouldn't we shouldn't minimise the fact that people find it a confronting thing to talk about. Yeah. Um, one thing I would add is that it, I think it differs a lot depending on what you're trying to talk about and who you're trying to talk to and what your goals are. One thing is a, a lot of people would say things along the lines of this, this is just stories, it's just speculation, there's not much grounding for this, this isn't like serious scientific work or something like that. Uh, and to that, for certain audiences, I think the right approach is not a story-based thing, but to instead engage with them on the level of the ideas and the arguments and highlighting we implicitly or explicitly make decisions about what to do about the long-term future and, and how to relate to existential risk. If we don't do anything about it, that is a choice. Um, you're implicitly deciding that you think the risks are very low or not worth working on or not fixable or something like that. Um, and instead, we should gather a bunch of different lines of evidence. They're all weak evidence. We're, we are very uncertain, but still it seems to point towards we should do something on this. But that's what I would do if I'm able to have like a longish conversation with someone who's really interested in serious ideas and taking it seriously, like maybe a policymaker or an academic or something. If instead we want to motivate a broad set of the population to be somewhat bought in, in the same way a lot of people are somewhat bought into environmentalism, but they don't really understand it, then yeah, maybe something more heavy on stories, maybe personal stories of why people are motivated. So I could say like the, the sort of sacrifices I've made and like the changes I've made to my life and like why I care about that and how it resonates with me, that that could be useful. Um, also, as like a meta answer, um, you can do message testing. You can try a bunch of different messages and do surveys and focus groups and, and also just try them on a bunch of people at your university or something and like see what seems to land. Again, this gets back into like the propagandist worry. Uh, we, we want to we separately also really make sure that the ideas we're communicating are true. Uh, but if they are, then it is useful to convince people. Um, another question from the audience, I guess this connects back to what we were saying a bit earlier, is... Uh, Storytelling of the future seems to be full of dystopic visions and doomsday scenarios, uh, whether in the news or science fiction. How important is it to create a positive future to get people excited about the world of tomorrow? And I assume this means create pictures of a positive future. Uh, very. I do think that we are. We do have a, a deluge of pessimistic narratives. But that said, anchoring back to what Michael was saying, the stories have to be true. I think creating these, um, you know, transcendent utopias that that promise. A lot of things that we can't substantiate uh, are not helpful to anyone and particularly they're not helpful to public discourse because it is too easy to then throw that into the, the zealot, loony, utopian camp and they don't become credible counter-narratives to some of the, the very concrete threats that we are facing as a species. So I think finding ways to tap into what Michael was talking about in terms of inaction being a choice as well, um, and trying to get people to understand better that the reality here, rather than uh, utopianism versus dystopianism, is more nuanced narratives, I think, about trade-offs, that everything in the world comes with trade-offs and that we do, you know, <laughs> bring the trolley problem front and centre. We really do have to get people more comfortable with the idea that a lot of change is going to happen in, in our lifetimes, whether we like it or not, and whether we really do anything or not. So the actions that we do take need to be designed to nudge things in a positive direction. And again, I think that's where the long-termist meme comes in, in a really important way that is a good example of a story that is trying to show the upside in terms of just how profound and long-lasting the upsides can be for, for intelligent life, but also how much we can play a role in that. And I think that can be a really rousing antidote to this sense, particularly with climate change and nuclear proliferation and war, that, oh, these problems are just too big and what, what can I do about them? I'm just shutting down. Um, that narrative is a really, really effective counter to that. And I think we do need more of that. Yeah, one, one thing found, well, I learned this 10 years ago. I think it's true. I can't remember. This is before the replication crisis. One thing I think has been found is like with climate change stuff, it's, it's not a good idea to just share a scary message, but to instead pair it with a hopeful message. I think in that study, it was things like what you can do about it and how you can actually tractably make a difference, but presumably also a scary message plus a positive vision of the future plus uh, a concrete valid argument about what you can do to change that. I imagine for many people be much more effective than just to focus on the doom or just to focus on the utopia. Um, another thought that comes to mind is we might not super need the positive stories. And the positive stories are often useful, but th there's, there's a range of different motives. So if it, for me, I'm, I'm most focused on getting people to actually reduce existential risk rather than getting them to care about the long term. And that's more like a, a, a goal for that end. 
And uh, th there's other ways to motivate this, such as a focus on responsibility, something like looking at how irresponsible civilization we would have to be, and, and framing this as like a virtue uh, 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 to, to drop the ball in this way. And that's kind of like storytelling, because it's uh, still a kind of emotional resonance and uh, has those connotations and stuff. But you don't necessarily need to sketch the utopia, just be like, imagine if someone had done this 100 years ago. You'd be really pissed off if they made us all die and you didn't get to be here or something like that. Um, yeah, this, this connects to another one of the questions. So the, the question is, uh, what do you think is the importance of a focus on transhumanism when there is uh, supposedly a roughly one in six chance uh, of humanity's existential risk this century? And I guess a gloss I'd put on that is like, how important is it to paint, to, to have people focusing on the long-term future and on transhumanism and on how good things could be, as opposed to just how the concrete risks that could be coming and that could matter for other reasons? Yeah, I mean, fairly similar to my to my last response. Obviously, yeah, you you need to continue eking away at the hard problems in in spite of the risk. I mean, for some of us, I think the risks are motivating inherently in themselves. It is a kind of story that makes you go, "Oh my goodness, one in six, <laughs> one in six chance. What the hell are we going to do about this?" So much potential uh, rests on that. In terms of like specifically transhumanism, I don't necessarily think it has to be that meme. I think it has to be any story that is effective at giving people a sense of how much is at stake this century, how much human and post-human potential is on the line, uh, how profoundly technology can change things for better or worse. Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear what Michael has to say about that. Yeah, um, yeah, I think it will differ between audiences. Often we want multiple strategies for the same audience and we also want to somewhat tailor things to different audiences. So yeah, there's sometimes you want to just focus on the facts and the arguments, sometimes you want stories, sometimes you want something that's not quite either, but instead of like a sense of responsibility and agency and being empowered and like this is, this is a story that really is happening, you really are part of, a lot of people are asleep at the wheel, you can wake up and you can help steer us in the right way. And that, that's, not, that, that's more like a pep talk or a speech or something than either a story or nonfiction. Um, yeah, so I think it'll, that is a somewhat vague answer, but, but that's some thoughts on that. Uh, another question is, um, what are your thoughts, and I'm going to mostly say for at least on this one, what are your thoughts on writing fiction that depicts the future through an EA lens, uh, both good and bad futures, and do you have any tips on writing a compelling or insightful story? I would love to see more fiction in that vein, and I would love to find the time one day to, to write some of it. It's been, a, it's been a long time since I've turned my pen to anything in that vein. Um, yeah, I, I think back to stories like 1984 that have remained so canonical and so powerful in the cultural imagination because they took social and technological issues of the time um, and wove them into a narrative that made the political compelling, um, made the choices before a civilization compelling and made the consequences of those choices feel real and profound. Uh, and I don't think we have good stories about existential risks. I think that there are a few sort of about climate change at, uh, nowadays, but particularly AI uh, is, is a really, really hard one to do in a way that's not kitsch and not cliched. Um, in terms of tips for con concretely how to, how to go about writing, I'm super aware of like writer gives writer tips sorts of advice. I really generally think that almost anything you will read in a standard blog post about writing is, is accurate. Um, all the generic advice applies in terms of do it all the time. Um, be the kind of person that is immersed in language uh, and that has a good intuitive sense of how things fit together and how stories work. Uh, but yeah, in terms of tackling those themes, I do think you have that event horizon challenge before you as a writer. And it's a big reason a lot of writers actually shy away from depicting those kinds of futures or really fork them out into either a hard utopia or a dystopia because something more nuanced in the way that 1984 is nuanced is really, really, really hard to write with, with AI. Yeah, um, I, I won't try to give tips on good writing. I, I used to write fiction a long time ago, but not much and not very seriously. But some thoughts on um, whether you should write fiction focused on these long-termist things. Uh, I, I think that there is a real place for it. I think it would be quite valuable to have some people working hard at this. For each given person, it's hard to say whether it's the right move. But um, 
yeah, it could be quite valuable. One thing is we could look at how valuable it is by looking at various historical case studies, so like 1984, what was the impact of 1984, and what would it have been if instead uh, he'd written like a white paper on this topic or something. Um, it, it, it's like, it's not obvious, like he, he might have been able to write a really compelling non-fiction treatise or something, I don't well, know. I'll jump in, Orwell did write a lot of non-fiction, oh. and it's, exactly. <laughs> um, it's, it's good, but it is not in the cultural imagination in the same way. A, a friend of mine actually said this t to me recently after reading my book he's like you should have written a novel instead that's that's what the people want um and it has a kind of staying power that the essays and the philosophical treatises don't well i think i think another question is like staying power versus actions happen so i definitely know 1984 is very prominent one could also do historical case studies of how much did it affect various people's actions that probably has been done i just haven't looked at it but anyway you could look at how useful these things have been in those ways, but also you can just try it. And I think not just for things like the long-term future and long-termism, also existential risk separately from long-termism, also um, just sort of the idea of being a, like an agent in the world and taking morality really seriously and working hard at it. For example, Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality, it's a fan fiction about Harry Potter. Uh, a grant was made to distribute these books, and I read that, like an EA grant was made to distribute these books. I read that that happened, and I was like, that seems crazy. Like, what are these funders doing? And therefore, I decided to read a bit of it to see if I could, like, really judge it. I love it. It's, my, it's like, one of my favorite pieces of fiction now. And I think it has actually really been great as an EA movement building tool. A lot of talented people got into EA and long-termism and stuff because of this. It's not about these topics, but it, it presents someone thinking really clearly and seeing themselves as an agent in the world who can do things and take morality seriously. So, yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of room for fiction to help with various EA things. Um, okay, one last real quick question. Uh, what are some key mistakes you think people make when talking about long-termism and transhumanism? Just at least, just one. Oh my God, no pressure to do that in 30 seconds. Um, transhumanism, the easy one. Defaulting to the, the kooky uh, histrionic sound bites, particularly transhumanism and life extension or cryonics. Going straight for those topics and not actually uh, going for the things that are most resonant for the average person that are less confronting, but also more relevant to the long-term future. Um, I would say dial back on the kookery as much as you can. Talk about health span extension much more than uh, putting your head in a vat of liquid nitrogen. <laughs> this is good advice to end with. All right, thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, see you around. <laughs>